BS from Medical College, Kolkata, and then did his first PhD at IICB under the guidance of Dr. Shantu Bandhupadhyay. Then he went to MD Anderson Center, uh, Texas University, to do, do do his second PhD. So he has two PhD degrees. He then uh, got his uh, postdoctoral degree from Columbia University. After that, he came back to India to join uh, uh, join ISCB. Now his uh, research focus is on innate immunity, dendritic cells, and uh, T cells, B cells, uh, autoimmune disorder. Uh, metabolic syndrome and other things. So, and he has a lot of uh, awards and honors, uh, uh, like uh, the recent one, as I remember, is that of the Mark scientist. The Poman, uh, it was like when, uh, getting you and uh, hearing from you is like uh, uh, the, all of the people from Kolkata wants to hear from you because you are what BS from Medical College, Kolkata, and then did his first PhD at IICB under the guidance of Dr. Shantu Bandhupadhyay. Then he went to MD Anderson Center. Uh, Texas University to do, do do his second PhD. So he has two PhD degrees. He then uh, got his uh, postdoctoral degree from Columbia University. After that, he came back to India to join uh, uh, join ISCB. Now his uh, research focus is on innate immunity, dendritic cells, and uh, T cells, B cells, uh, autoimmune disorder, uh, metabolic syndrome, and other things. So, and he has a lot of uh, awards and honors, uh, uh, like uh, the recent one, as I remember, is that of the Mark scientist. The Poman, uh, it was like when, uh, getting you and uh, hearing from you is like uh, uh, the, all of the people from Kolkata wants to hear from you because you are working uh, day and night out to uh, uh, for the COVID patients and to uh, treat them. So uh, we, are real, uh, we are really grateful that you have given us uh, this time and um, allowed uh, but, and uh, speak of you. Okay. Deepa one, the stage is yours. Now I won't speak much because we have a time constraint. Hello. Uh, I, I really thank Thank uh, Gunshan for uh, inviting me here. Um, it's a uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege uh, to be uh, talking in in front of all, all these people. I mean, I, I'm I, I'm guessing that uh, a lot of uh, the audience is actually uh, they are actually students uh, from Vivekananda College, and uh, so likewise I. Uh, Deepavan, just a minute. Uh, there are teachers, uh, the, there are uh, doctors, there are uh, others also who have, uh, who has been, uh, as I can see, many of them are doctors, many of them are teachers, and some of the right. uh, IICBNs are also there. Right, right. Okay, so uh, what I'll do, I'll uh, share my screen so that you can see. Can you uh, can you enable the screen sharing option? Hello. Uh, so when I'm trying to share my screen, yeah, when I'm trying to share my screen, it says uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Yes, uh, I think I can. Diction hmm? So can you see the slides? Yes, yes. Yeah. Hello. 
Can you all see the slides? Yes, we can okay. see the command. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, so please uh, bear with me because my slides are a bit um, designed for students, uh, but that doesn't, uh, but it's, it's good to have, uh, good uh, in webinars is you can, you can actually to, uh, know about this, but as I would uh, start with uh, is, so we are, we are dealing with this coronavirus and the major uh, the most peculiarity of this virus is um, it's called NCOV or novel coronavirus. So naturally, uh, whatever Gunjan says, no one in the world knows much about this virus. Okay. Well, we are in 2020 and so we have a whole lot of data gathering uh, technologies available. So we now know the sequence of the virus. We know how the sequence is changing with time in different geographic locations all over the world. Nevertheless, uh, the clinicians are actually feeling the hit. So the clinicians are realizing that uh, we don't really know much about the virus. We don't really know much about the disease the virus is causing. And that's a peculiar thing because most of the, we, I mean, human beings have, uh, like the, this planet has seen so many pandemics, right? Um, in human history of like civilized human history of 7,000 years, we have uh, documentations of so many pandemics all around the world. And so we, we I mean, all of have, uh, all of you have uh, uh, learned about this sense about Spanish flu. So this is a Spanish flu hospital. You can very well uh, figure out the similarity with the recent quarantine centers and the makeshift hospitals that we are having all over the world. But actually, life never uh, stopped. So this is a court being held in San Francisco during Spanish flu in 1918, uh, almost 102 years back. People were playing baseballs. And this is another pandemic, which is AIDS, which is still ongoing. Uh, we don't really uh, care about these pandemics because they spread in a different way. And there are easier ways of preventing you from contracting the disease. And that's why you, you don't really bother of the, about the pandemic, but the pandemics are nevertheless on. There, is, there was a SARS pandemic, you can see young kids uh, practicing ballet with masks on. So life goes on. This is not the first pandemic that human beings are actually experiencing. So you have to understand that. So, I mean, despite all the negativities, yes, we have been um, witnessing different pandemics being, uh, being um, occurring in the different parts of the world. This is, uh, again, this is the H1N1 flu clinic in Brooklyn 2009, the Ebola pandemic, which is actually still going on. Uh, but the basic difference between the current pandemic that we are having and all these pandemics, recent pandemics that I have been talking about is um, the sheer number of cases all around the world and the time that it took to contract so many cases. So this is the most important thing about this virus. This virus is not that deadly. So the, the dark blue uh, square actually tells you how many deaths occur in those cases. You can actually compare with all the recent pandemics, the deaths are much uh, higher. I mean, they have been much higher in other pandemics, but in SARS-CoV-2, the death has been much low. But it actually spreads fast. And uh, I think uh, by this time, uh, you know that there is something called the secret productive rate because of the lockdown, there were much news to uh, cover by the media. And the media had been covering all sorts of epidemiological pathologies that uh, policy strategies for virus prevention and naturally people have already known about all these words. So now this basic reproductive ratio has been the most peculiar thing about this virus. It has a very high um, R0 or this basic reproductive ratio, almost 5.5. There have been different estimates. Early in the pandemic, people thought it's around 2.5. That means one person who has got the infection will actually uh, spread the infection to 2.5 uh, more persons. But as the pandemic went on, we now know that the basic productive ratio is really much higher. It's almost at the range of 5.5 to 6.5. That means 
one person who is infected can actually infect 5.5 to 6.5 people. And that's, that's perhaps the reason why this virus uh, spread so fast all over the world. You can actually see this is data till uh, end of uh, February or beginning of March. By that time, all the continents actually had these infections reported. And uh, that was mostly because of this R0 factor, which is so high. And uh, now you know that this uh, all this worldwide lockdown I mean, these are, this is the worldwide uh, air traffic, and which is which has now stopped. I mean, this was the major reason how uh, this virus spread all over the world so fast. But now this is stopped. But you uh, can rest assured there are other kinds of traffic that are still going on. Like this is a ship traffic that's going on all over the world, and it's not stopped. You can't you can't really stop it. At the at, at, in this year of 2020, you can't really stop this kind of um, shipping and this kind of connectivities uh, all around the world. So there is no way you can actually lock down countries and uh, prevent infections from occurring when you're actually dealing with a virus with such a high basic reproductive ratio. And more importantly, this is a droplet infection. So in a droplet infection, this is not HIV, that you will prevent certain things from happening and you are not going to get uh, the infection. So in a droplet infection, there is hardly any way you can actually prevent infection. You will follow all these all this, uh, recommendations that are um, uh, described in all the media portals, in the policy portals, uh, but... Uh, I mean, among 100 times you encounter uh, possibilities of contracting the virus, 10 times you'll make mistake and you'll get the infection. So that's not the, that's not a very good strategy to um, prevent infections from occurring. Actually, we can't really prevent them. occurring now. By that time, you have actually know this. Um, so scientists have been talking about this from early March that yes, I mean, a lockdown is not going to prevent infections. And uh, now we know that yes, it did not prevent infection. Well, it actually did. Hello. Uh, so uh, actually, it actually did few things that I'll, I'll talk about. Uh, uh, Ipaman, just a minute. A poster of just a minute, please, uh, please, everybody mute yourself. Please mute yourself. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So this is a public uh, um, flyer uh, by Department of Health City of New York in 1918 uh, when Spanish flu was happening. And we are actually um, facing this similar situation. So this kind of uh, flyers after 100 years uh, is still uh, relevant. And we are still uh, thinking that these will actually prevent infections from occurring. And now we know that it's, it's not really being that successful. And after the lockdown is over, I think it will be uh, more apparent that it, it, it's not going to be successful. So this is uh, India now. I just uh, got the data in like a few minutes back. And you can, you can actually figure out it's we are almost uh, reaching uh, the two lakh infections all over the all over India. And you can, you can rest assured that it will increase um, very fast uh, in coming days, but the point I'm try I'll try to make that this is this is not uh, that bad uh, an infection. I mean, this is as I said that the deaths are much lower, and um, in, in this kind of an infection, which you can't really prevent, which is a droplet transmission, um, the the only hope is uh, getting immune, right? And getting immune to that infection. Uh, and I'll talk about it later. So you can only be immune to, an to a viral infection or to a virus which has enabled itself to infect in human beings by getting immune. And you can only get immune by uh, having a vaccine. And vaccines are not coming soon. So the only way you are going to get immune is by getting infected. And uh, looking at the basic reproductive ratio of this virus, the way it has it had spread, the the speed with which it had spread all over the world, you can rest assured it's going to spread um, very close to us. Uh, much more vaccines are available. Uh, having said that, let us uh, try to find out what 
what kind of uh, immune response you can actually expect in this kind of virus infections already there have been um, some studies with sars cov 2 i am not going to get into those details if you are interested you can um, raise those issues we can actually discuss um, but uh, this was largely uh, designed for uh, students and for this kind of viruses you your your immune cells uh which are uh, classified into different uh, axes of the immune system like innate axis and adaptive axis the basic difference is the innate axis doesn't really uh, know for sure which pathogens they are dealing with the adaptive axis rather knows which exact pathogen they are dealing with now to know which pathogen they are dealing with they need to get educated and uh, so that takes some time meanwhile the innate cells which are uh, not really Uh, distinguishing between these different pathogens are in action and uh, so in this virus this this virus actually targets a very all of you know i'm not i don't want to get into that in detail but you all of you know that this actually targets a receptor which is a c2 uh, a c2 um, we we have evidence for uh, having this uh, a c2 receptors in the lung epithelial cells in the gut epithelial cells we now know that this virus is capable of infecting these cells but uh, i can tell you ac2 is not that restricted in expression they are actually expressed in different tissues in different cell types um, there are a lot of heterogeneity in its expression levels but definitely there are expressed parts of the body we should actually be i mean we should uh, call ourselves fortunate that despite having such a wide spread receptor all over the body the outcomes of this virus infection is not that bad and uh, so we should be actually happy rather than being afraid about this virus now um, as you can imagine for um, any, any any this kind any of this kind of viruses there will be immune cells some of the immune cells will try to clear the viruses um, there are macrophages t cells but in this sars cov the infection uh what happens the macrophages and t cells are at times hyperactive because um they they see uh, a lot of tissue damage and uh, in the in the especially in the lung epithelial cells and the t cells and macrophages are there now these cells are uh, designed um, by the na- by nature in a way that they not only respond to the uh, pathogens that they encounter they also respond to the tissue damage that they encounter Uh, over past 10 15 years we know that there are molecules released by damaged tissue which can actually activate uh, immune cells on immune system uh, which we call the danger signals or the damage associated or danger associated patterns and there are um, receptors for those patterns on these immune cells and immune cells get crazy when they see a lot of tissue damage the major problem with starts cough twin at least in the case of lung epithelial cells the gut epithelial cells we don't know much uh, at this point uh, the major problem has been very widespread tissue damage in some of the patients not in all patients in very few patients there are uh, there is very extensive tissue damage in lung and that creates a whole lot of problems in terms of hyperactivation of the immune system which releases whole lot of cytokines that uh, is released in the systemic circulation and that actually affects other organs in the body and when whenever there is inflammation you can see the inflammation will secondarily um, cause different tissue damages the damages of different tissues in the body and that will cause multi organ failure and that's how uh, the unfortunate outcomes of this infection which are definitely rare only 5 to 10% uh, sorry only 5 to 10% of the patients who are symptomatic are um, showing this kind of worse outcomes um, so but uh, in those patients this is the tissue damage that's uh, happening that's that's major problem and uh, as i said um, the so you can actually get immune uh, you, the the only way of active immunization is vaccines and uh, i'll i'll try to um, tell you what are the different approaches that are being taken by scientists all over the world and also in india in terms of developing vaccines 
Now, uh, these vaccines actually take a long time. That's this fever depicts. Um, I'll explain later on. <coughs> and uh, another way of getting immune is passive immunization, and which is what uh, Munjan was talking about that I, I am trying to work on. Uh, and this is not new. We, uh, perhaps a, a lot of you know already. This passive immunization has been um, had been there for almost hundred years. Actually, passive immunization using recovered patients' plasma was the uh, discovery that uh, had won the first Nobel Prize in medicine. Emil von Bering in 1901, who got the Nobel Prize for using this technique in diphtheria. And uh, so this is not new. And as I was describing, there had been multiple pandemics even in the modern era, and um, letting I mean, he's forgetting even the all the plagues that the biblical time plagues. All the modern uh, pandemics also uh, had seen use of this uh, technique of passive immunization because in a in a virus or in a bacteria, mostly in viruses, which is so novel that you don't really know uh, which drug will. Uh, Work will work against it. You don't have a vaccine in your hand. This is the only way you can get immune. The third way of getting immune, as I said, is getting infected. Now, uh, in, in passive immunization, what we are trying to do in Kolkata, as many groups are doing all worldwide, even in India, there are almost three trials are ongoing. One ICMR trial, uh, the one trial is ongoing in Kerala, and this is the third trial in West Bengal. And what we are trying to do is recruit recovered COVID-19 patients, taking plasma from them, and uh, with the hope that there is virus neutralizing antibodies. Uh, the problem is we don't really have a dependable serology kit at this point, so we don't know. We can't we can't really measure the amount of antibody in the plasma at this point. This is the case all over the world. All over the world, all the plasma trials are uh, being uh, are happening with, with a with a belief that there are virus neutralizing antibodies. There have been sporadic reports, sporadic research reports showing that yes, recovered do have virus neutralizing antibodies, but as um, the, I mean, useful serological not available, um, we don't really know at this point how it is happening. We are actually, in our study, we are actually taking a different approach. Uh, we, we don't really have specific key tests for these virus neutralizing antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, but what we have knowledge that these antibodies will be produced by antibody producing cells. And um, in a healthy individual, you don't really find a whole lot of actively antibody producing cells in the circulation. And we are actually looking into recovered patients who have very high circulating antibody producing cells. We think that this is a result of their recent SARS-CoV-2 encounter, and that's how we are actually selecting plasma donors. Now, uh, I'll just uh, briefly talk about herd immunity. I think uh, most of you are really confused about this herd immunity business, and uh, perhaps this audience knows already about herd immunity. Herd immunity has been uh, in discussion, mostly in case of vaccination strategies, but in, in a virus like SARS-CoV-2 where there is a vaccine, the way you can get immune uh, is by getting infected. Uh, again, herd immunity is a very costly affair, right? So this is uh, an animation that shows that if there is no uh, hard immunity and if 0% uh, people are immune, how fast the infection spreads. And if 20% people are immune, um, then it, it spreads a little slower. It, it goes like this. If you have 60% people are vaccinated, then again, it's even slower. And when it's 80% vaccinated, uh, there is hardly any spread. And uh, so... So you are hoping that with this infection uh, spreading all over the world and also in your country, uh, there will be a whole lot of people who has contracted infection and uh, they have got immune and they have not succumbed to the infection. So they survived the infection. Actually, most of the patients, if not 90% of the um, patients perhaps are asymptomatic, asymptomatic to the, uh, after contracting infection, they are asymptomatic carriers. Uh, rest of the people are symptomatic. Even then, most of the people are having very mild symptoms. I mean, this is my first-hand experience. Asymptomatic carrier experience, no one can vouch for, but this is our guess, educated guess. But for the uh, symptomatic patients, we actually have clear evidence uh, in the hospitals. You, you will find 
80% of the people are having really mild diseases. They're just having running noses and things like that, very mild flu-like symptoms. Very few patients are getting um, worst disease outcomes, and that too in patients who have other coexisting conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and things like that. And uh, so, as I said, I mean, the lockdown is, is not really going to prevent. It actually did something um, to help us fight this infection. And uh, what happened, it actually, um, because there were control in the transmission, the capacity of the healthcare system was not overwhelmed. So you still, if you are getting infected, you can go to a hospital, get a bed, get a doctor that, that, that uh, who is available, who comes and see you. And so this is what you want. You don't, you don't expect that you are not going to get the infection. Uh, maybe you are not going to get the infection because most of the people around you are already infected um, and immune. That's why you didn't get the infection. Uh, but just by preventing um, certain things, you are not going to prevent infections from occurring at least close to you. But when the infection happens slowly, your healthcare system is not going, going to get overwhelmed. With a virus of this sort, which is spreading so fast, infecting so many individuals, and uh, so there will be people, there will be much more people uh, requiring healthcare attendance uh, than our capacities are. And so that's the major problem with this infection. And uh, so you, you expect that this will not happen. Uh, and I think the lockdown actually gave time to enable the policymakers to equip the healthcare system. Hopefully they have equipped the healthcare system uh, sufficiently enough uh, so that they can deal with this situation. And as I said, uh, again, so very old people, they are rather having worse, worse outcomes. Most of the younger guys are uh, doing pretty, pretty much okay. I mean, these are mild diseases. Most of them are getting mild diseases. Well, you can you can uh, raise your hand and say that you, you know someone who succumbed to worse kind of disease, even in the uh, younger age. But I can say uh, these are outliers and usually with coexisting um, health conditions. So the uh, so point is you don't have to fear that much. I mean, you, you, the only thing is you have to protect the elders because the elders are uh, more prone to having um, worse disease outcomes. And uh, that's how we have to prepare ourselves. But this virus is not going to go anywhere. I mean, if on uh, the third planet from sun, this virus has arrived and has enabled it to uh, infect human beings, uh, you don't expect it to go away. And so it will be here. And uh, the only way it will be insignificant in our lives but when we, we get immune, as I say. Now, uh, you have been uh, uh, talking, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, hearing about different kinds of drugs that are being proposed in this infection. Clearly, you can you can understand preventing infection is really difficult without vaccines and vaccines. And I'll talk about later. It's, it's, it's not going to be so fast. Uh, but uh, your goal is to, I mean, most of the scientists and doc doctors' goals are preventing um, worse outcomes in patients who are having symptomatic diseases. And so you actually need good drugs and uh, which can actually prevent uh, untoward outcomes from happening. And uh, looking at the uh, biology of this virus, that people have been proposing different um, drugs in, uh, which will actually um, target different parts of its biology. And if you are not expecting a new drug to be developed against this virus, the, the speed with which the virus is spreading you don't have that time. You don't have that time of developing a new drug, uh, trying it, uh, like assessing it for toxicities and all, and then getting approved and using it in patients. So the major focus has been to repurposing the existing drugs. So there are so many drugs that have already been approved in terms of toxicity profiles and efficacies in different diseases. And for those drugs, you already know the toxicity profile. And if you can find these drugs have 
additional benefits in terms of preventing um, worse outcomes in SARS-CoV-2 infection, then you have got a candidate. And there have been multiple candidates. Well, SARS-CoV-2, as I said, goes through this SC2 receptor, and there are uh, there may be monoclonal antibodies and, as I said, convalescent plasma that will actually prevent this, um, neutralize these viruses, and that uh, that's how it will actually prevent infections from happening. And there have been uh, other drugs which are actually, uh, for example, hydroxychloroquine, much talked about drug, uh, which is uh, thought to prevent the viral uncapping in the endosome because it actually prevents endosomal acidification, which is important for viral unca uncapping. So you can actually expect hydroxychloroquine will be very effective in early part of the in early uh, stage of the diseases where uh, viral a uh, virus infecting a host cell is very important. But in a later part of the disease, when the uh, tissue damage has already occurred, this drug is not going to be uh, that effective. And, and I personally think that that's why this, all these controversies around this drug, because this drug has its efficacy, um, I mean, it has a window of efficacy in the stage of uh, this disease. And there have been drugs which are targeting viral proteins, viral enzymes, and which will actually prevent uh, viral proteins from being synthesized. Now, um, I, I just share uh, very recently, we, we did some work uh, in terms of repurposing the drug. Uh, we took an uh, interesting approach um, so, uh, along with Dr. Shandip Pal. We tried to find out why this virus is uh, so different. Because with this virus, you find this all the comorbid uh, conditions are actually portending worse outcomes, like mostly diabetics are having really bad disease and most of the deaths are occurring in these metabolic comorbidities. And we wanted to find out with the related viruses, uh, what is the difference in SARS-CoV-2 that is causing that. And we, um, you can't really do a whole lot of experiments amidst the lockdown. And we analyzed uh, uh, like previous previously available data sets. And we just wanted to uh, find out in the in vitro data sets, in vitro gene transcriptome data sets, in the SARS-CoV-2 infected lung transcriptome, and also the metabolic syndrome preclinical models, what is the sharing factors that are happening? And we found that compared to other viruses, which have caused limited pandemics in recent times, SARS-CoV-2 has a very unique um, gene expression signature after infecting the host cell. And um, so, and, and we found that there are very key pathways. Most of them are metabolic pathways that are being targeted by SARS-CoV-2 in the epithelial cells. And these pathways are also affected by diabetes. You, I mean, the doctors will know a whole lot of obese and individ obese individuals and diabetics are also very prone to lung diseases, uh, COPDs and asthma. And that is also because of the these metabolic pathways being deranged in the lung epithelial cells and we think in the SARS-CoV-2 the same pathways are being hit and that's why these diseases are uh, these um, uh, patients are actually having much worse disease and much uh, worse outcomes and uh, based on those metabolic pathways we actually uh, propose that metformin is uh, can be a very interesting drug to prevent this tissue damage and uh, prevent uh, worse outcomes and this is a very interesting drug and uh, this targets these metabolic pathways, out of which we actually thought that this will work. And uh, but there are other um, effects of metformin which can actually prevent the uh, hyperimmune response as well, and also boost the protective immunity uh, against these viruses. Uh, indeed, uh, very recently uh, there had been a clinical study which actually um, showed that our guess was right and metformin treatment was actually associated with decreased mortality in this metabolic comorbid, metabolically comorbid uh, patients. So as, as you can say, I mean, the, so most of the drugs that are being tested are repur I mean, repurposed drugs because we don't have time to develop new drugs. And, uh, and I think the drugs will be the major player in this infection because vaccines will take some time. Now, there have been definitely efforts. Almost 130 trials, uh, 130 candidate vaccines are there all over the world, as I speak. And uh, so this is the virus, and people have been uh, taking different approaches to develop these uh, vaccines. 
for example, some are um, inactivating the uh, virus, uh, and so these are inactivated vaccines, and these are well-tested vaccines because we already have other vaccines in clinical use, which are th these kind of vaccines. For example, chickenpox vaccine, measles vaccine, they're all inactivated viruses. And so, and these are the uh, uh, easiest way to develop a vaccine, and that's why a lot of groups all over the world are trying to develop these vaccines. There are DNA vaccines, uh, which uh, actually uh, try to express uh, viral proteins uh, through a plasmid. There are uh, viral RNA vaccines. Um, again, there are many candidates from different uh, companies and different academic institutions all over the world. Uh, there are VLP vaccines where you actually make a virus-like particle just expressing the virus protein, the virus antigen on the uh, on a lipid uh, liposome, and then it, it looks like a virus, and it actually can uh, induce uh, immune response against uh, SARS-CoV-2. And definitely, there are recombinant vaccines, um, like which are again there are. Uh, many vaccines, again, in clinical use, which are recombinant subunit vaccines, you, you take the exact antigen of the virus and try to immunize in presence of an adjuvant like alum and create a vaccine. For example, the hepatitis B vaccine we use, we know that this that's the hepatitis B S antigen that we are actually uh, using for in the vaccine. So there are uh, many, uh, many different approaches that are being taken. But as I said, said the vaccines are not going to come uh, soon enough okay so according to one estimate if you if you follow the normal vaccine development protocol the way usually vaccines are developed uh, one estimate says the vaccine is not going to come before 2036 i don't think coronavirus will be relevant then and if you obviate the need for different steps in this vaccine development program like if you start trials early, if you just uh, remove all the research um, components in the vaccine, then also one estimate says that it will come uh, at 2032. Again, I don't think with this, that's the speed that this vaccine, uh, this uh, virus is spreading with uh, worldwide, uh, by that time that this virus will be irrelevant. Uh, there have been, I know most of you, I'm not going to believe me, but there have been reports that September, November, uh, mid of December, early January, we're going to get vaccines. Uh, I am very skeptic being an immunologist. It's, it's, it's not that easy. Um, so so I'll, I'll end here. So if you have any specific questions, um, the, you can ask. Uh, I'll be really happy to answer if I know those answers. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, if uh, I have asked the students to post the question, I can forward it to you, Dipuman. Then only uh, you can give the answers. And uh, the read teachers read and the son. Okay, uh, if they want to, any anybody uh, wants to ask a question, please unmute yourself and can go on. Or you can because read I out. don't have a. Uh, do you have a question? Yes, unmute yourself and ask a question. Tonjipta, do you have a question? Anybody? Yes, Tonjipta, go, go. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can just put the question. Yeah, so the, you are uh, trying to, to deliver the decoy receptor soluble C2, C2, right? That's the idea. I think, I think that's, that's a very, very interesting idea. That's a, that's a very interesting idea, actually.
Lokman uh, told me just that he's going to come again because he wants to answer all your questions. Whoever has some questions, uh, or uh, maybe he can enlighten us with some other uh, views. Uh, so, uh, Dipoman uh, is come joining within f four to five minutes. Please be there. Uh, he's uh, just give him a five minute coffee break. He's going to join. Uh, so you be there, be, uh, give him just five minutes break. He's uh, joining the session again. Uh, so the students, I will ask you that if you have questions, please put it in the chat box and send it to me. I will forward it to him. Students, if you have questions, write the questions in the chat box and give it to me i'm going to forward it to him because since we have a time constraint he might not be able to answer all your questions uh, in this time frame because there are teachers there are others who might also have questions so please uh, write the questions in the chat box and send it to me. i've already got one question uh, it has been put up by shorab that uh, what is the current progress of plasma therapy in India and in our state, West Bengal? Uh, so I will put forward this question to Dipoman. Um, anybody else, if you have questions, you can write it in the chat box. I am going to put it forward to you. Uh, Dipoman, already a question has come. Uh, it has been put up by a student, Shourab, and he has asked that uh, what is the current progress of plasma therapy in India and especially in our state, West Bengal? Yeah, so, uh, so as I said, there are three uh, independent trials that are going on. Um, and so you have, you have seen media reports of convalescent plasma being given to the patients and then patient recovers, etc. In this kind of cases, what happens, you don't really get to know why the patient recovered. So was it because of the plasma being given or the patient's natural response to the disease, right? And so naturally, perhaps you have also seen uh, 29th April ICMR and uh, Ministry of Health has issued that non-trial use of plasma therapy is prohibited in the country. So at this point, what uh, all of us are trying to do is trying to find out a statistical um, conviction that plasma therapy is actually working by itself and it's actually adding benefit to the whatever standard therapy the patients are getting. And so we are at that phase. There, are, uh, there have been patients being recruited from uh, in different trials. In our, our trial also, we have started recruiting patients so what you do in this kind of trials, these are randomized controlled trials. And what you do, you uh, set that these are the patients, these are the con patient conditions where you will actually think of giving plasma transfusion. And then whenever you are, a patient comes, you randomize them to get or not get plasma. And then there is no bias in terms of choosing patients whom you are giving plasma. For example, a patient who is going to recover by itself, and if you give plasma and he recovers, you can't really say that plasma therapy works. So all these randomized controlled trials will give you some idea whether plasma therapy is really working. And then uh, when the data is out, that will take a few months, I think another two months at least uh, in all three trials. And uh, so, then you will um, perhaps see uh, see an addition to the standard therapy protocol that at this stage of the patient um, or the, this stage of the disease, if a patient arrives at this stage, you can actually give convalescent plasma. And uh, also, uh, we are also trying to find out not all patients who will be given plasma will recover, right? So not all of them will respond similarly. And so you need to know what are the parameters in a patient which are making them respond to plasma therapy. And so these trials are also incorporating those data. Once these data are out, um, perhaps 
uh, I mean, we will see that we can actually select judiciously patients who will get plasma uh, therapy for treatment and uh, will be uh, much more uh, frequently occurring. And worldwide also, this is the only case, but uh, I would say in China, there was a match control trial, which was not a randomized control trial. There had been a very um, good outcome of the trial. And also, you, if, as you know, all over USA, there is a national trial going on on plasma therapy. Their data is not yet out. I know they have rec started recruited, recruiting patients. I talked to some of those investigators. And um, so they, they are, their data will be out perhaps next month. And uh, then we'll, we'll get to know how it is happening in USA. Now, when you are dealing with this kind of immune modulatory um, therapies, there will be a whole lot of host intrinsic parameters. Something in the host that will prevent him or her from responding to the plasma therapy or something that will help him or her to respond to plasma therapy. So those data are not yet out. As I said, this is a novel virus. We don't know much about it. We know a whole lot of information about sequences and things like that, but how the body responds to the virus. We don't really have a very clear idea about this. And uh, so I would say that's the, that's the status. So um, yes, this is, it, sh it, it should work based on available data, but host intrinsic parameters, we don't know. Uh, so there may be some uh, new discoveries there. Uh, thank you, De uh, Deepavan. There is another question from a um, student called uh, Pinku Haldar. Uh, he's asking that, is it possible to use some uh, components uh, such as uh, Tulsi plant, or uh, that is, uh, or solic acid or uh, tea in drug to block M protease of COVID-19? This compound show high uh, binding affinity in silico drug designing process. So, the, as I said, I mean, th there will be many molecules that will tell you uh, that you will feel that they, they may work. But all of these are not yet approved for clinical use. And whenever you are dealing with a molecule which is not yet approved for clinical use, there is a whole lot of regulatory uh, roadblocks. So, you have to uh, finish a whole lot of trials, a whole lot of phases of trials to arrive at a stage when you can actually give it to the patient. With SARS-CoV-2, we don't really have that option. I, I don't think um, this message has been put forward in media too much. This virus is spreading too fast. We don't have time to develop new drugs. You have to rely on drugs which are already having efficacy, I mean, toxicity data or uh, like, I mean, you know, you know that these drugs are not really killing human beings, and they are. They have been used for uh, different clinical uses, different clinical contexts. They have been used in, and so in that case, it, it, it essentially comes down to repurposing available drugs, and that's the challenge all over the world. You won't find any agency or any scientist or any laboratory or any pharmaceutical company trying to develop new drugs against the virus. Why? Because this virus is spreading too fast. We don't have that time. So as I said, so these molecules may be of interest, but at this phase of the pandemic, uh, you can't really uh, test them. I mean, it will not be prudent to test them. Okay, Dipaman, there is one more question. Is there any compatibility issue with the plasma therapy? It has been put up by Shashwato. So compatibility, I think you're talking about ABORH system blood grouping. Yes, the plasma is usually given uh, after blood group matching. Um, and uh, But still there are minor uh, antigens that will not match, right? And But you have to figure, you have to remember that you're actually giving the soluble fraction of the blood. Not any, I mean, cells are not going there. So a whole lot of problems are reduced. And... Plasma is actually given in few, there are few clinical contexts where routinely plasma is given. Uh, for example, in a, in a condition called disseminated intravascular coagulation, where uh, a patient's coagulation cascade is activated inadvertently and there is, there is coagulation happening all over the body. And then uh, the clotting factors are diminished in the body. 
all the coagulation factors are diminished now if there is a fresh wound the, the coagulation doesn't happen in those kind of cases plasma from another donor is routinely given the uh, approved protocol for treating those patients so you give fresh frozen plasma this plasma will have those clotting factors and you re replenish this patient with those clotting factors so that's why the plasma therapy and its adverse effects the clinicians uh, clinicians already know quite a bit there are adverse effects in very few patients there are allergic reactions but there are ways to prevent or mitigate those allergic reactions from happening to an extent where it will actually complicate matters so that's why people are much more confident okay so we have you have experience of giving or donating plasma and transfusing them to recipients and so you can actually carry on this kind of uh, therapeutic approaches uh, so shonjib da you can uh, continue with the discussion that was going on shonjib da yeah so that was a, a good discussion so so the molecule that you are talking about that uh, binds to this enzyme uh, four methyl uh, i was talking about four methyl umbelliferon this right. is a this is present and in a, a plant called uh, uh, pincetani radix uh, this plant has been used by the chinese people chinese doctors okay. and because, because that plant contains that uh, four methyl umbelliferon probably they have got good result of that uh, this uh, this drug is not about uh, removing the virus or uh, it is about to minimize the uh, syndrome symptoms i mean the acuteness of the symptoms uh, if we can decrease the amount of hyaluronic acid little bit of that and i think the patient will not enter in that stage in a critical stage and that uh, probably this four methyl umbelliferon i was searching for that uh, in indian plants in which indian plants it is present in more amount i uh, I, i found the uh, babul plant it is uh, acacia arabica that plant contains uh, quite a good amount of four methyl umbelliferon probably it is also uh, available uh, in in medical stores uh, in purified form i think so and there is hyaluronic acid synthetase inhibitor uh, this is inhibitor of hyaluronic acid synthetase enzyme has to enzyme which which forms the hyaluronic acid and if you can, you can also use probably hyaluronic uh, hyaluronic days this enzyme which will, which will also dissolve a little uh, hyaluronic acid i was concentrating on this part because other areas uh, i have you you have discussed already uh, the sites of um, where the drug can be targeted the rna polymerase or or the the receptor uh, the salicylic receptors or the whatever or the protease that the serine protein that is present beside s2 enzyme uh, napam state that we are talking about all these things are already there but if we can use this kind of medication i think uh, it will be helpful what yeah, is the so, as i said the uh, any new molecule which is not in clinical use uh, taking the modern Inside, medicine uh, yeah taking the modern mm -hmm. medicine route of trials and uh, getting it approved mm -hmm. will be difficult and i i know i mean i am not very aware of the very much aware of the ayush um, things but i i know there are uh, calls from ayush department as well to come up with new ideas uh, so i i think uh, you, you can propose there uh, but i think in this kind of situation a screening assay developing a screening assay will be of utmost importance because you have to show in case he is some uh, model problem with uh, such stuff has been that the, uh, the mouse model the animal model of this infection mm. was not available right away and now it is available because there are ac2 human ac2 transgenic mice and i mm. think uh, national center for biological sciences have developed it mm. uh, themselves and also uh, an import has occurred to uh, few institutes in the north uh, from germany and so i think the target i mean the strategy should be first uh, establish the proof of principle in those models uh, whether it can actually prevent the tissue damage from ha happening mm -hmm. uh, i'm not sure whether this sars cov 2 uh, induced yeah, lung epithelial yeah, damage yeah, pneumonia yeah. is having hyaluronic acid uh, involvement uh, to that extent uh, but i think it's it's a worth thing to pursue 
and definitely for yeah, uh, uh, phyto, phyto chemical you have to take the ayush root exactly so, one molecule of hyaluronic hyaluronic acid can absorb thousand times its volume of water and that's why it forms right. uh, when when the amount increases it forms a jelly like substance over there in the right. alveolar cavity and because of that though, that anoxia kind of thing that maybe happens. maybe maybe i don't know i'm not sure yeah i don't know but i think uh, i think there have been calls from ayush ministry and perhaps you should explore that i have not seen i was uh, about that i was screening separately the which plant can cure because basically i am a botanist mm -hmm. and uh, i had a microbiology specialization i was in dr adhya's lab oh. uh, senior to gunjan yeah. uh, so i did uh, some gene knockout and rna i kind of thing over there uh, in dr adhya's lab uh, nice to uh, see you over there and listen to you it was a nice uh, presentation thank okay. you very much i was thank very good thank you shanjita to, uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, there is another question from shashwato that uh, how many patients can be treated by the plasma from one donor and uh, how effective is it well how effective we'll find out uh, mm. but uh, so that's a very important question so at this point we are um, most of the recommendations because we don't know how 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 much dose have to be used but worldwide a uh, specific dose has been fixed upon which is 200 ml of plasma uh, on two consecutive days uh, and the usa trial is also following this icmr trial and my our trial is also following the same thing and um, so in that case from our donor you can take hardly 400 to 500 ml of plasma and so you can understand so one donor will actually cater for one recipient and so if if you if we find that even less than i mean less than two doses is sufficient although our trial cannot deliver that knowledge uh, but there will be subsequent trials to reduce the dose of convalescent plasma in that case perhaps one donor can actually save two recipients uh, but at this point it's one is to one ratio uh dipoman there is a uh, question which uh, i'm putting forward to you i did not uh, uh, me i mean i did not understand what he means to say that if we minimize academic research from vaccine development would it be possible to develop a proper effective vaccine i think he well, wants to <laughs> wants to say <laughs> that you separate vaccine development from academic research i think so i may be may may be may be wrong <laughs> no i think yeah i mean i think this is a very important issue i mean people have been debating on this uh, most of the vaccines that are in clinical use have been developed by industry because vaccine uh, development i mean for that matter, matter any drug development taking those uh, technologies to a stage where it can be used clinically involves so many different um, expertise for example in a drug or in a vaccine there are different expertise that are uh, important to develop it to the final form and in the academic institute you are not going to get those kind of expertise in the same place and that's why that's where industry succeeds in developing them and the idea is usually the concept level development is done in academic uh, environment while the industry takes it forward because taking from the I mean, taking the concept to a product uh, in I mean, involves whole lot of expertise all those expertise cannot be uh, available in an academic institution and only industry can uh, deliver that kind of or gather those kind of expertise in the same place and deliver those kind of products so but most of the vaccines have been developed by industries and i am pretty sure that the sars cov2 vaccine if it's available some day will again be uh, developed by industries but that doesn't minimize the contribution of academic environments because they generate the proof of principle studies the knowledge that is important for taking the concept to the product so you have to develop the concept first and that's where uh, the academic institutes play a big role Okay, thank you. Yeah, know, there was a good question. Uh, Shonjita, one more question. I will just then hand it over to you. The student, uh, okay. she has okay. asked that at which stage of the disease does uh -huh. administering plasma therapy to a COVID-19 is likely to yield the best result? 
Well, that's a very, very, very good question. So, so all of us are actually pondering over that question. If you think that your convalescent plasma is working solely through virus neutralization, then you you would think that this uh, plasma should be given early enough in the disease, because in at least in COVID nineteen, what's happening? There are major two phases. First phase is a viral infection. Second phase is of on hyperimmune re reaction and tissue damage. And there are reports of quite uh, similar to DIC or the disseminated intravascular coagulation. There are um, the thromboembolism in the vessels. Now uh, you, you can understand, right? So virus neutralization can be the sole mechanism and there may be other mechanisms which may affect the later on thromboembolism part of it because plasma is known to help thromboembolism but in that case um, you can, you don't have to use a sars cov to recover patient plasma right a healthy plasma will also serve the same thing so that's why it was very important to include placebo um, healthy plasma in those trials but till date, none of the trials all over the world has used that. We actually wanted to use that. We were barred from using it. Um, but so th those questions are not yet answered. So we will we'll get those answers in uh, after the trials are over. Okay. But that is a very, very important question. Okay. So at this point, we can, I can tell you, we are only given, giving or uh, recruiting patients who are having at least respiratory distress. And we know that this guy can actually go to frank ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and can have very um, bad outcomes. Uh, if pa in patients with very mild disease, they've got infection, there's certain rhinorrhea, like nasal secretions, there is no point in going to this kind of therapies in those patients. Okay, Shonjib, uh, now you can put up your question. Okay. I wanted to know one thing, because you're directly involved in the process. Uh, whether this uh, testing RT-PCR uh, is being done in groups or uh, or single single uh, cases, are they sampling a number of people and then doing the PCR to make the thing faster, or they are doing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, that's that, that's a very important thing. So ICMR has um, so till date it's single singly done. Okay, but ICMR has actually approved pulling off uh, samples so that things can be done faster. Exactly. So the idea is you exactly. pull the samples and approve samples in pool. Now, studying 64 samples can be pulled. Um, uh, some Israeli uh, scientists have done yeah. 64 samples. Yeah, so I will just tell you, so uh, ICMR has approved only five samples can be pulled. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, well, it's better than one. But, uh, but uh, CSIR, uh, uh, two CSIR institutes are actually actively uh, doing 100 samples pulled together and uh, you can actually do combinatorial pooling. Moreover, uh, people are slowly, because the cases, case numbers are growing so fast, even this combinatorial pooling is not going to be enough if uh, this happens. So people are now thinking of CCMB has started a program where they will uh, pull the samples, say 500 samples together, exactly, I was uh, bar <laughs> and barcode them and do sequencing. So yeah, yeah. sequencing, you can actually increase the throughput uh, to a great fold, right? So so that's the upcoming okay. thing. But I, I know that already there are uh, pull samples testing in some of the states. In West Bengal, it's still one sample is getting one sample down. but i think and is there any statistical uh, statistical sampling uh, method is, is being i, I think for so that? i think so i'm not an expert but i have been sitting in different meetings and i heard about this those algorithms <laughs> you, I'm, I'm trying to, actually i'm trying to convey the message through you if, because you are in direct contact with them you can suggest uh, yeah, if so there, there are algorithms uh, there are algorithms to um, develop combinatorial pooling and uh, so that you, you can that actually in consideration so three exactly. three step three step testing will give you data from 100 samples and so 
yeah so it's mm-hmm. being done it's it's being done uh, ncbs mm-hmm. is also Thank doing you. a community Thank of pulling program and ccmb is also doing that that's nice Thank you so uh, thanks a lot dipon i i don't have really don't have yes, words sir. that uh, to express my gratitude towards you because in spite of your busy i cannot say busy it's uh, over busy schedule you took some time out for my students for all the students whoever here they have they were present for the teachers for doctors and everybody i'm thankful and dipon uh, uh, if if still students have some questions i will uh, whatsapp you uh, if you have that sure, sure, sure. and yeah sure. I, i will send it to uh, uh, you uh, course, to them and uh, thanks a lot all the thank participants you. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, thank you so much thanks. thank you and so i'm ending the meeting thanks a lot thanks. thank you very much